think it's it's important to understand the different sectors, uh, obviously, and how how they are related, unrelated. Because if people talk of shipping, they always say dry bulk tankers and containers, and I think containers in particular is 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 not only shipping. It, it's part of a very complex supply chain and logistical chain and i'm sure we'll, we'll touch on that later on because i think the the last 12 80 months have shown how vulnerable the supply chain is and how important it is for the global economy so i think the to the to get the understanding of shipping's role in the overall economy is 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 quite important is it about creating a culture from the top and bringing it down to the organizations because how do you get this out in practice which you obviously has, have managed to do right leadership is, is what it's about setting the agenda prioritizing work managing leading delegate delegating projects and, and and work so it's it's important on the one hand and on the other hand it's also important to provide a, a sense of a joint vision welcome back everyone super excited to be joined by Konstantin and Konstantin thank you so much for taking the time Thanks. Nice to that you have me, Christopher, and looking forward to, to the discussion. Likewise. I know it's going back a bit, but first memory of shipping or finance, how old are you in that moment? Well, my father was in shipping, so I have a bit of a, uh, let's say, shipping uh, DNA uh, inside. Um, and certainly finance, I mean, that goes back uh, quite a while. But uh, I mean, shipping certainly from, from the young days, I would say. So obviously you are in Germany. Maybe spend just two minutes explaining the city and also the relationship between the city and shipping because there's a strong connection there. Absolutely. Uh, so I was born in Hamburg. Um, I grew up in Hamburg um, and uh, now I live in Hamburg with my family. I have been out of Hamburg for a while to, to Sydney and Shanghai, but, but Hamburg is, in shipping terms, the capital of Germany, uh, um, if not together with Rotterdam of, of Europe. So um, actually from my uh, office here, I can look at the, at the port, I can see container ships, I can see the terminal. So um, obviously shipping is all around, and in particular container shipping when you talk in Hamburg terms. Definitely. And is it fair also to add on the cruise industry from a Hamburg perspective? Yes. I mean, the cruise industry has, uh, we actually had a, had a new cruise terminal just built, I would say, three, four years ago. That obviously has uh, slowed down somewhat with the pandemic, um, in, in contrast to, to containers at least. Um, so, but yes, I can also look actually, I can see the cruise terminal as well from my window here. Where are Germany in terms of, if we lift this up to uh, a green discussion in terms of energy, batteries, etc., and also that, you know, the, uh, the ports need to facilitate this new technology. Do you see anything that gets you very excited in terms of fuel savings, etc., that will be relevant for cruise and shipping? Well, uh, I mean, obviously, this is uh, this is currently all all over the place, to put it that way. I think uh, it, it still lacks somewhat of a, of a fully structured approach. Uh, I think everyone knows things have to change, and and the shipping industry in particular um, will will see a significant transition over the next five ten years, and that applies to the terminal, so so the port, um, as well as the the vessels on 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 the oceans. I think in Germany, there has been quite a green push already. Um, you know, five to ten years back, um, when when you know there was an exit from nuclear decided by by Angela Merkel, um, and, and now we have uh, 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 at least you know a government that includes the Greens. So so there's uh, there's certainly more initiatives to to come our way, um, not just in shipping, but more general in terms of the green transition. And uh, I think it's going to be exciting. Um, it's necessary, but it also needs to be organized and structured uh, properly. And I think there's still a way to go. Couldn't agree more. Just one minute or two minutes on Sydney. What's the best part of Sydney? Is it the beaches, the surfing, or is it just the experience of going abroad that helps you regardless in your career and life, I guess? Um, I mean, uh, Sydney was, uh, I did my master's there. So I, I worked besides for a shipping line, actually, for a container shipping line for Hamburg Suit when I was in Sydney. Um, obviously, the beaches is, is something you need to mention. And I, I, I would not be honest if I, I'd say that the beaches weren't a, a key ingredient of my time in Sydney, um, of course. Um, I wasn't that much of a surfer. I tried my best. Uh, didn't, didn't make it, I would say, with all the 
let's say, uh, well-built Aussies around me, uh, they certainly did a better job on the, on the surfing board. Yet, um, I mean, the city is just fantastic. It's wa water all over the place. Um, and it's, it's a good mix of, of let's say, the, the leisure and, and relaxedness of, uh, of the Aussies uh, combined with, you know, uh, also some, you know, central business district flavor. So I think it was a pretty, pretty decent time I had there. And if it's okay with you, I think we'll leave the Australian Open outside of this podcast, right? The regulations and rules, or do you have any strong opinions you want to share about that? Uh, well, not, not not really, but obviously as a German, I followed Alexander Zverev, who uh, who lost um, um, just recently, um, pretty clear. Um, so it was high hopes, and and I obviously followed it a lot, including the the Djokovic, uh, um, let's say, situation. Because I play tennis myself, um, and, and I'm passionate about tennis, so um, it's something that, uh, despite the, let's say, a time difference, I, I I tend to follow these days. Quarter is the new way of doing company research. Their first mission is to enable access to conference calls, investor presentations, transcripts, and earnings reports. Their second mission is to create a completely new way for companies to reach their investors and vice versa. Quarter is 100% free. They include companies from 15 markets today and plan to add more. They prioritize requested companies and users can now leave reactions while listening to the conference calls. So make sure to follow them on Twitter at Quarter app. Uh, let's go over to shipping. If we start very broadly, if you had to give a lecture in shipping, and of course you can, you can take one class in shipping and one class in container, where do you start for someone who wants to learn about shipping? What do you think are the key ingredients to teach someone who wants to get involved in shipping? Well, I think it's it's important to understand the different sectors, uh, obviously, and how, how they are related, unrelated. Because if people talk of shipping, they always say dry bulk tankers and containers. And I think containers in particular is, is, is not only shipping. It, it's part of a very complex supply chain and logistical chain. And I'm sure we'll, we'll touch on that later on because I think the, the last 12, 18 months have shown how vulnerable the supply chain is and how important it is for the global economy. So I think the, to, the, to get the understanding of shipping's role in the overall economy is, is, is quite important from a, let's say, um, high level standpoint. And, and more operationally, obviously, to really be on board of a ship, and understand how it works um, uh, is, is, is very interesting and important as well. So you, you have those two layers. I mean, I would say from a global economy down to the, to the let's say, main engine or auxiliary engine on board of a ship. I think this is what is fascinating about shipping. And this is how, how to actually learn the, the full, you know, you know the, the broad range of, uh, of shipping activity as such. Is it a too simple or too easy to say that containers should be the easiest part of shipping to understand because of the raw numbers? If you, if you compare it to tankers, right? It seems like tankers, you really need to understand everything all the time. While container, you should be able to forecast the general trend to maybe a larger extent. Yeah, I think it's, it's just different drivers, right? Um, I think tanker in terms of, you know, the operations around the vessel is certainly more complex because you're you're, you're handling you know a liquid um, and 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 you know the the safety requirements have have been stricter. I mean, obviously things are getting uh, balanced out of, over time, but I think container shipping uh, because the economy is so global, it's it's not only point to point, right? Tankers and dry dock is point to point, so you load it and you you discharge it and and that's it. Um, and then it's someone else's problem, so to say, uh, or, or, or not. Um, and in container shipping, it's the complexity of the supply chain that in my book is, is very delicate. And if you look at the pure value of goods, I mean, container shipping accounts by far for the biggest transported goods by, by value um, because it's, it's the most valuable goods that are being transported by, uh, in containers. So if you look at, like, let's say, 90% of, of, of transported goods are transported by sea, and out of the X, 60% is transported in containers. And value-wise, it's, it's even more. So I think it's, um, it's also the supply chain, the, the pr production chain, just in time, just in sequence delivery of, of, of parts into a production chain, which makes container shipping um, or container transportation extremely complex. 
Um, so I think the drivers behind it is probably, you know, the oil price peaks and, and has its own dynamics. Uh, yet the complexity of the goods and the services and then also the production behind container shipping, I would argue, is even more complex. Um, as we see over the last 12, 18 months, as I said, you know, a disruption in the supply chain creates complete chaos globally and impacts the whole economy and not just one part of it. Definitely. If we use uh, the lecture as an analogy and you had to present the business case you probably did in your mind in 2017, maybe it's also relevant to add on to separate the containers from you know, the feeder market to the more broader market where you have Maersk, etc. How would you break that down? Well, obviously, if you look at the um, at the container market, it it basically starts uh, if you want so in in a factory, right, or, or somewhere where a good is 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 produced. Uh, it goes on on a truck, um, and container shipping is part of an intermodal supply chain. So so you look at truck, rail, and the sea voyage, and I think that is important. And on a sea voyage, you have smaller legs feeding legs, so to feed into the hubs. Um, this is where our vessels are involved, or intra-regional traffic, where regions are interconnected, in particular, intra-Asia or intra-Americas, intra-Europe. And this is where our vessels operate. And, and, and they either feed into the hubs for the very large ships, uh, 13, 20, 24,000 TU um, vessels, and this is how it's organized. So it's a it's a well-established hub spoke system. Uh, so feeding into the hubs, as well as a, a interconnectivity of uh, regions. And I think especially, and that's worth highlighting, this interconnectivity has increased over the last decade significantly, um, with more and more, let's say, smaller economies also um, exporting a lot of goods or being part of a production supply chain in a way. And I think this is what makes uh, container shipping so exciting is the interconnectivity of this world, um, um, which, which has fueled the growth in terms of globalization and economic uh, wealth, uh, but is also vulnerable to, um, to disruption in a way. Maybe it's, it's easier for people to also understand this by mentioning cities, right? Because you have the traditional routes and maybe the feeding routes is a bit different. So maybe we can add that on to the argument for people to understand you know, the cities and the, the, the routes, basically. No, absolutely. And if, if you look at the, I mean, the, the main lane trades where the big ships operate are the so-called east-west trades. So it's basically uh, China, particularly Shanghai, uh, to um, either the US. Um, and this is where, you know, the 13,000, 15,000 TU vessels go, or um, China to Europe. For example, Hamburg. I mean, to Hamburg, the, the larger ships on this globe go to Hamburg. Uh, they just passed by my office, uh, to be to be frank. Um, not fully loaded because of uh, you know draft restrictions here in, in the Elbe River. Um, yet they go here. So it's it, it's really the these east-west routes where vessels operate with only five six port calls, um, and then you know the boxes get. Um, carried onwards by smaller vessels. Uh, and these are the vessels where we focus on. So it's feeding into those hubs or from those hubs, centralizing or decentralizing cargo streams, or as I said, connecting intra-regional ports like in, in Asia to have a string down the coast of, of China um, and up again, um, or connecting Southeast Asia with uh, mainland China, uh, or connecting, for example, the South America, the Caribbean with uh, mainland, uh, mainland US. Um, so, so there's a lot of kind of the big hubs, um, and, and those are, are dominating the large ships or are being dominated by the large ships. And then everything else that is interconnected with uh, smaller trades. If you look at your company, how do you summarize that value creation from 2017 to 2022? Because it's quite remarkable if you look at the numbers, right? The value creation of that. So in hindsight, was it, it's never easy, right? But does it, how, how was the feeling structuring this in 2017 and getting to this point? which has to be quite remarkable. If you take the value creation, it can't be that many cases who, which has provided these amount of value for such a, so few years, basically. 
No, I, I agree. And I mean, it's, it's, it's really fascinating to look at the company where we are today, uh, not even five years old, 1.5 billion in, in market cap. And we have been the you know, best performing stock last year on, on the whole also stock exchange with 330 uh, different names. So, so that's, that's something certainly to, to be proud of for the whole team um, here at MPC. I think it's, it's worthwhile to say, you know, although the company itself started on a blank sheet of paper, the background is the MPC group, right? So, um, and the MPC group um, um, is, is basically family owned yet stock listed in Frankfurt um, with uh, a long experience in real assets and in particular in container shipping. So I think it's important to understand the fundament that this didn't come overnight. So we really, with a team of professionals, we prepared this, uh, um, let's say this story and this, this entry into the space with this new company, for quite some time. Obviously in shipping, it's always about market timing. It's about you know having the right entry price. And, and I think our analysis was right um, to that, that at least the entry price was good. What happened thereafter obviously was a bit of a roller coaster, admittedly, because things didn't you know move um, in the same kind of uh, um, you know way that we had expected it yet. When we did it, 2017, raised the first 100 million, we um, said it's a three to five year recovery um, and rebalancing of supply and demand, particularly favorable for the smaller uh, vessel sizes. So, so we, we basically saw you know, um, a rebalancing and then obviously you had trade war, you had the initial phase of COVID, which, which led to quite a setback with, with you know, lockdowns, et cetera. And now we are obviously in a environment that is the, the best container market in history. And to be positioned to benefit, to get the full leverage from that with a sizable fleet of 66 ships is obviously fantastic. Um, and, and we are now able to lock in long-term cash flow. So I think it's, uh, it has been an, an, a fantastic journey uh, so far. I think it was also a, a tough ride at times. Um, um, yet, I think we have been able to build a company from a blank sheet of paper um, maybe in, in startup terms, you would call it a unicorn uh, to, to, to something of 1.5 billion market cap um, with a, a kind of equity raised of, of just a shade below 500 million. So, so I think that um, that is a very you know, good story in my view and something we want to continue to build upon uh, and, uh, and take it from there. Couldn't agree more. I think it's super impressive. If we take the... Uh the uh, Ray Dalio quote that, you know, pain plus reflection equals progress. In what time was it most painful for you? Is it negotiating with bondholders? Is it being close to bankruptcy? Can you give us an example or a period where you felt some pain being the CEO and responsible for this? <laughs> uh, no, absolutely. I mean, uh, obviously pain is, is, is easier you know, taken uh, with the team, and we have a we have a fantastic team here at MPC. So I think that's that's obviously someone stands out by by virtue of role and having to take these these negotiations. Um, and and certainly the phase where you were unable to first of all visit people uh, and had to negotiate with them and look at these black screens on on teams where where you know you, you definitely have the camera on, but everyone else might not, and and you need to convey a message in times where the visibility in the especially the early phase of COVID was i mean no one knew what tomorrow would bring right um i, I think that was a, a convincing people of something you didn't really know yourself um because no one did um at that point in time and asking for concessions that certainly was a i would say painful period of time and that was the the let's say first half of 2020 in particular um, but then I think we uh, we were able to convince everyone that, that it, it's something that is has never been there in history, and and we we jointly need to position ourselves to 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 weather the storm, and and so we did. And I think in hindsight, everyone um, you know all the bondholders got repaid, even at a premium. Um, you know the equity holders had their had their um, uh, their recovery, and and now a very strong market. So I think overall it was worth. The pain, so to say, but it was uh, definitely an intense period of time that um, that I certainly will not forget in my life. Is it fair to say that these periods are inevitable in shipping? Maybe compared to you know 
a SaaS company in year five to 10, right? So if you're scaling the right way, you should be on the trajectory. But obviously, we're going to talk about the cyclical nature of shipping. But isn't it fair to say that these periods are inevitable if you play this game long enough? Or At least they, they can happen and you should expect them to happen. Um, that's that's how, how I would put it. I mean, you, you can obviously be lucky and, uh, and, and just, you know, hit the wave at the right point in time. I mean, I, I would say in hindsight, we hit the wave at a good point in time um, because obviously, um, you know, in the beginning things moved into the right direction and then we had a trade war and the beginning of COVID and, and now, you know, we, we are riding the wave. So I think it's, it's about being prepared for the unexpected um, and make sure that you do not over level your company, for example, that you maintain some sort of flexibility and, and you know, we had a fairly low leverage, actually, financial leverage, uh, even when we went into the more difficult times in the beginning of COVID. Um, and I think that was, in, in hindsight, the only reason why we were able to, to maneuver through it, yet it was tough times. So I think you should expect the unexpected, um, and then you were prepared in shipping. So today, is it, I mean, it's a great growth story, obviously, but it's very hard to repeat that exercise the next five years in terms of the return on investment, or it should be very hard, right? So take us to today. You obviously are very positive, optimistic about the future, and you have, uh, I mean, the contracts also, you know, implies that you should be, but just explain how hard it is this next challenge coming up for that return on investment, because you can't replicate that or copy it. No, no, you can't. But I think in, in, in shipping in particular, it's about being very rational in your decisions. And, and uh, uh, you know, it's not about growth. It, it's not all about growth. Uh, I, I think to have a, a certain size, especially if you want to be listed and want to really have a, a stock that is worthwhile for investors and for the company, um, it's important to be very clear in, in, in what to do. And, and in shipping, there are times when you when you have to grow and invest and deploy capital and that has to be well timed and then there's time to to return capital to investors and to be also very clear and transparent about it and uh, at least in in my book now is the time to return capital to investors and now is the time to to really um do you know walk the talk as we did on the strategy we walked the talk we said we will buy ships in that segment uh, we didn't deviate from that path. We bought ships at what I would say attractive prices. And now, you know, we will return capital to investors and we will be very selective and disciplined on growth. That doesn't mean we will not do any growth measures by, by buying new ships or the like, but we will be very disciplined and, and, and rational about it. Um, and currently, clearly, the focus is on returning capital to investors. And I think that's what people can expect. Um, and I think if people know what to expect, then, you know, if someone enters now, they shouldn't expect overnight 20% return. They should expect a very visible and tangible path to dividends and distributions. Uh, and I would argue last year, we have been the best performing stock from a growth standpoint. So, so appreciation and value. If you run the numbers, uh, and I haven't compared that with, you know, everyone who's listed, but I would argue this year and going forward, we will be a very strong dividend stock. So, so it's really time to, to, to take what is on the table. And I think now there is clear cash flows to investors on the table, a very high dividend yield. Um, and that's, uh, that's what we're here for. And that's what people can expect. Can we also just add on that argument, the, uh, the link between you know, being in the spot market and having longer visibility, so people also understand that in good times, you, kind of in, you, you are able to lock this up, right? You can have strong certainty about this scenario playing out because honestly, if you just look at the market, right, and, and the rates, they can go up and down for weeks, right? But some companies you know, secure their runway, sort of saying. Absolutely, and I think that's, uh, that's the let's say transition from uh, growth, which is by nature maybe a bit more volatile in container shipping because you, you, you buy ships and then you need to charter them out, right? Um, so, so now we look at a market when we bought those ships, we were able to charter them out for three, six months maybe. And now we're in a market where we can fix ships for three years. Um, so, so we have a visibility, we have a, a revenue backlog uh, well above 1 billion, so 1.3 billion. We have an EBITDA backlog of 850 million. 
Um, so we have a very, very clear path and earnings visibility going forward. And I think that that has changed. And that's not just for one year, that's really stretching out. Um, and we have a hence a very, very certain cash flow development. And, and, and that's why we're also kind of very outspoken about uh, the distribution plan that we um, have implemented. Actually, this Friday, we have a, a EGM uh, where we ask for, for authority to, to execute this distribution plan. And that is built on extraordinary dividends where we return capital to investors upon a vessel sale, for example. So, so more one-off events and a constant and recurring dividend of around one knock per quarter um, uh, that we will also pay out. So, so it has those two ingredients. And, and I think that is fundamentally based on improved visibility, good backlog, and, and hence also longer, longer contract durations. Very interesting. So if we're trying to predict for, let's say, the whole sector in containers, I know predicting is super hard and forecasting is also super hard, but there are some very interesting dynamics going on right now. We are maybe going getting out of COVID soon. Supply chain has been very much disturbed by this. So just give us a bird's eye view. What are you seeing? Are there something you're very interesting to see how it will play out because obviously you have the inflation and price index as well right so there's a lot of components to be mm. interested in right now no absolutely i think i mean if you look at, at shipping in general and that's obviously not just container shipping it's actually the global economy there's a the whole scheme of energy transition will impact us globally and shipping in particular um, of course uh, undoubtedly it will play a key role over the next five ten maybe twenty years I think for the next two to three years, um, it will have an impact, but not you know you will not be able to exp um, replace the whole fleet uh, within that period. So it will be a, a, a transitional process uh, that will be a key scheme. I think in the more two to three year horizon, especially in container shipping, I believe we will see a focus on supply chain resilience and reliability and people actually now willing to pay up for it. Uh, since 2009, in container shipping, people earned money, but that was more the freight forwarders, the shippers, and less the liner companies and the owners. Um, and now with this disruptive event of COVID, which is now already, you know, 18 months down or, or into into really disrupting the um, the supply chains, I expect people are willing to pay up. And paying up doesn't necessarily only mean higher price; it also means longer periods and more contract uh, durations. And that's good for the liner companies and for owners like us. And I think this is the trend that will not stop because people have seen how vulnerable the supply chain is and the consequences of this. And, um, and you know, by having short contracts, you, you would still be vulnerable. And we don't know what might happen down the road. Um, maybe it's not another COVID lockdown, you know, supply chain disruptive event, but it might be something similar. And I think people have learned how important it is to have a functional supply chain and how bad it is to have a non-functional supply chain. So I think this is a scheme also in terms of strategic priorities for shippers and people who are highly re reliant upon the supply chain functioning, uh, that that play a role and that will play a role. So people will pay up for it and that will be seen over the next two to three years in container shipping in my book. And this is really interesting um, to, to, to play out. And secondly, in terms of demand and supply, because that's eventually the, the driver. Next 12 to 18 months, there is limited supply growth. After that, we see more and more orders. Container shipping has seen significant orders last year, especially in the larger sizes, less to a lesser extent in our sizes. But I would still expect a moderate demand growth of, let's say, 2 to 4%. So overall, I'm, I'm very positive for the next two to three years. And then I see energy transition really reshaping the industry in a way that that might be um, quite dramatic uh, over the next five to 15, 20 years. How will this play out for sort of the FedEx, et cetera, DHL? Because obviously being a ship owner, right? You kind of like, you're not responsible for the whole chain, right? So there's someone who has to pay this, right? So obviously if you talk to a CEO for FedEx, he will have a very clear standpoint on what he thinks is important going forward. Can you just explain these dynamics? The, and the different stakeholders in the supply chain. Sure, and and uh, I mean, obviously, you have a you have a shipper who has, for example, uh, a parcel um, with a few 
boxes, right? Um, and, and they put that in, in a container with FedEx or with, with Kuno Nagel or other freight forwarders. They assemble it, put it in one container, and then that container, you know, picks up the different uh, parcels and then gets loaded on a truck. That truck goes to a terminal, is being loaded on a vessel operated by Maersk, potentially owned by us, um, right? And then this vessel goes on the sea voyage and, and arrives, let's say, in the US from China, uh, gets discharged, and the box goes on a rail and then on a truck um, and gets delivered to a supermarket. Uh, so, so this is, you know, the whole journey of a container, and it's fascinating, actually, to, to, to see that. Um, and it's even more complex if you look at a refer refrigerated container, if you have perishable goods, for example. So, um, so that's the way it works. But I mean, if you, to your point on, on on FedEx, I mean, in the end, if you look at a pair of jeans, a, a bottle of wine, which, by the way, is being transported in the container as well, the the additional costs from you know slight increase in freight rates is marginal. We're talking about two or three cents on a pair of jeans. So that, that's why I'm also, and that's different in container shipping. That's why I mentioned this topic of the value, right? The, the, the value of that is on board of a container ship is significantly higher than on, on a tanker or a dry bulk vessel. So you have more goods that can digest the additional cost. Um, and in the end, the end user or the consumer will have to pay for it, unfortunately. But I think it's then, you know, distributed more, more um, evenly um, on, on certain goods, pair of sneakers, pair of jeans, bottle of wine. It's a few cents in total. And that will eventually also pay for the energy transition in my book um, when it comes to container shipping. It's very, very fascinating. If you look at this trajectory, so what's the worst case scenario? Like a black swan or a white swan, call it whatever you want. But do you have to mention war to get you afraid of something? Or do you see a worst case scenario where you actually have to protect your downside? Well, of course. I mean, the situation in, in the Ukraine um, or maybe potentially Taiwan, China, I mean, these are, are concerning developments, not, not just on a, on a, let's say, personal uh, level, um, but also for, for the industry, it, it, it will have implications. Um, of course, I mean, we as a company have contracts um, and, and, and then, you know, vessels will go different routes. The Ukraine and Taiwan in itself doesn't really ruin the picture from a global trade perspective, but it will obviously affect uh, a trading pattern. It will affect the way we, we operate vessels. Um, of course, always very important, uh, actually the, the most important aspect from our perspective is uh, crew safety, um, right? I mean, we need to make sure that we operate uh, very safely and that our crew is protected and, and, and the well-being of the crew is, is super important. Um, so, so there are, you know, implications of, of, of that nature that, that, that could, uh, change the picture. But I mean, as an example, not a war in, in war terms, um, but uh, a trade war, as we've seen between China and the U S had an impact on the market, not, not necessarily really on the pricing, but on sentiment and on people not being sure whether to commit into capex or, or the likes and and then you know it had an effect on container shipping so um so that is a risk um again the longer the contracts the better it is then also evenly shared along the supply chain and um, if we just had ships on short contracts we would be way more exposed um, now we have a good backlog and also the liner companies Maersk and others they also have longer contracts now so there's more visibility on the ship owner side, on the liner operator side. And now the, let's say, risk is, is more shared also with shippers and freight forwarders because they have to commit to longer contracts. So I think it's the industry has stabilized. Um, the balance sheets also of uh, owners and in particular liner companies has improved significantly. You know, um, people always look at the high rates and say, oh, can that be sustainable? Well, it can if everyone uses the capital uh, or allocates the capital in a way that they also de-risk their balance sheet and do not expose themselves to more and more risk. And that is certainly something that we will do, not just to um, uh, to pay out dividends, but also to de-risk the balance sheet. Um, and the good news is the cash flow is so rich that uh, we can afford it um, and the liners do the same. So I think this is this is very important going forward. But uh, to your point, obviously, the certain developments globally raise concerns but but i don't think at this stage that there's any black swan uh 
tangibly there, um, but you never know. We haven't seen COVID coming. Uh, and in the beginning, it was a nightmare for container shipping. And, and now it's obviously uh, the opposite um, for container shipping as such. Do you like to use these scenarios in like a probability sense or do you more fancy the path dependency because probabilities are so hard in unknowns, but if you have path dependency, it's easier to kind of like connect the dots if something were to happen. Yeah, it's, I think it's, 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 it's a good question, but it's, it's difficult to answer um, because in the end, in the end, to some extent, you look at probability uh, and, and, and then it's obviously likelihood of occurrence and then materiality of effect right and 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 you know we we obviously when looking at our contracts make try to make sure that we are you know as good protected as possible uh, so not to have any any you know war clauses in there or the like to to actually have uh, certain restrictions in terms of trading area if it if it gets declared uh, uh, you have these war risk clauses etc so all of that is part of the contractual agreement so you need to be very careful and monitor these uh, uh, very very carefully um and that's that's how we would address it um but um again some of these things since shipping is a global uh, industry you know you have to look at the global map um you cannot just look at your uh, one country where you sell i don't know bicycles in a in a shop in in, in oslo or tromsø for that uh, for that matter uh, or in hamburg so you really have to you know think about interdependencies and potential scenarios uh, globally. And that's that's what makes shipping so exciting. Definitely. So you mentioned the people, and I think it's interesting to highlight, highlight them a bit because so many people always say that shipping is an asset play, right? But you know, when you when you hire so many people, you have to say it's a people play as well. But then the question becomes, how do you become great at treating your people? Because maybe... COVID shows that companies can't really move the needle because they are regulated away and there's international law. So I don't know if you can just rent a helicopter and get them out if they need, if you need to change the crew, right? So maybe spend just a couple of minutes explaining this dynamic where every ship owner says they want to take care of their people, right? But can they move the needle to the extent they should be able to move the needle when needed? I mean, the short answer is during the pandemic, it was it was very challenging for everyone. I mean, we we also we, together with our crew managers, we we also uh, hired uh, or, or rented planes and brought people from A to B. Yet, you know, the whole regulatory and and, and restrictive environment changed overnight. So, what was possible and 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 the, and a viable path yesterday was then forbidden the other day. So, so really adapting to new rules and new schemes it was also not countrywide it was for example in china you have local rules uh, that apply overnight so it's it's really challenging um communication is important uh, with the crew to to make sure that you know everyone sees that you know you are trying your best uh, yet uh, that might not be enough to to achieve the the goal that you want to achieve in particular during uh, during a pandemic right so I, I think that is important we have pushed a lot to to get the crews vaccinated as soon as possible um to 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 do whatever is is within our you know capabilities in a way together with um uh, let's say partners um and and the good thing is that the industry since it's global and everyone works globally uh, the industry is also quick in in supporting certain efforts yet Given the complexity of different governments, etc., it's, it's it's not easy to find common ground uh, within a short period of time. So, um, one can just say, you know, you need to be, you try to need to try to be con- on top of things. You will never be on top of things eventually, but uh, to to work hard and 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 to listen to people um, is key, and to try your best. I mean, for example, on on crew costs. I mean, we ha- we have had higher crew costs and and and. Well, we will have higher crew cost also next year, um, because it's it's so important to make sure that the people, you know, have 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 a, have a solid, uh, let's say, working environment, uh, considering the circumstances. If we take a crew member perspective, how can they uh, review their companies? Because obviously, it's a global it's a global demand for their services. I don't think maybe it's. You know, the salary should be pretty even. I'm just expecting, I don't know the numbers, but from a crew member perspective, 
what should they think about when deciding which company to work for, right? Yeah, I think sometimes you can also be unlucky, so to say, because it's it's not, I, I wouldn't, I mean, obviously there are good companies and, and less good companies in, in a way they, they treat people, of course. But I think it's, it's as I said, it's also a lot of that has to do with regions. I mean, if you, if you trade in a region and you, you are allocated to a vessel that trades in a region that is more challenging from that perspective, um, it, it has nothing to do with the, with the company um, yet. Um, I mean, crew, there, there are huge crew organizations. Um, they have a lot of platforms on Facebook groups or other Facebook-like uh, media where they exchange, uh, you know, their experiences and, and, and also their takeaways from, from having worked for certain companies. So I think there's quite a good transparency on, you know, what is a good company to join and, and what not. I think the, the crew members are very well uh, connected. So it's 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 important to um, uh, to 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 consider this, uh, and it's important to treat everyone as good as you can, uh, because it will backfire otherwise. And and I think this is a very important, uh, at least part of, of of our agenda, to make sure that you know everyone gets respected and and gets treated as as good as possible. Um, so I think there there is quite a quite a transparency to to answer your question. Good points. So if you look at, uh, if we're going to talk a bit about the investors. So I want to start with a broad question because I think you are quite unique in that sense. So what's your definition of an investor friendly company? And then we can also dive into your special relationship with your investors, which seems to have been, it's a great case, right? And how to communicate with investors, keep them posted, create communities, etc. But let's start broad, right? And then we can get deeper afterwards sure i mean i mean f- from our standpoint it, it is really about having a, a clear cut strategy that people they understand what to buy into and then as i said earlier walk the talk uh, you know not deviate from the course i mean obviously adjust the course if the external environment changes um, yet to to really do what you have promised because it's it's important to be reliable to be consistent to to, to, for people to to know what the company and management does, um, I think this is most important. And and you can be wrong. You can be wrong with your investment thesis uh, as an as a, as a management and as an investor. You can also be wrong by putting the money on on the wrong horse. Um, but then at least you know it was a decision that was clearly you know uh, cut in uh, in stone, so to say. Right. That's number one. Um, so walk the talk. Be clear communicate if you adjust the course so people know what's what's happening um, and then try to be at least in our view when it comes to shipping which is so capital intensive um, and cyclical to be very rational on capital allocation and not to do funny things I mean now obviously we we generate a lot of cash we, we could also say let's let's buy 20 new builds right um, just to grow the fleet just to be bigger and uh, you know be considered in in the global market as you know a very big company etc but i think that's that's not what you want to do and what you should do and what investors should expect rational capital allocation um, and this is not always the case uh, but to be very clear on that and to tell people what we do, what what to do and that's why we said you know there is time to invest capital and there's time not to invest capital that much. And we are at least at the very moment in a situation where we want to return capital to investors. And I think this is this is how you should communicate. And this is this is how, how people should understand. And then as you rightly said, if people you know who have bought the growth story are not interested in being involved anymore because they want to do 20, 30 percent uh, return, um, then they should you know probably you know consider something else. We are now in a, a more dividend scenario, yet our dividend yield uh, this year, well, depending on our market cap, but is, is certainly significant. Um, so you could actually even generate these kind of returns by, by a dividend, but, um, but it's, it's now a, a more value, more returning capital to investors uh, scheme. And that's, that's what we want to be outspoken about. Be rational in capital allocation, also disciplined in growth at the right point in time, Uh, and communicate clearly to the market. How do you nail this in practice, right? Because obviously, I don't think I will find a CEO that disagree on these great points, but to actually do it in practice is something else, right? So is it like, 
Is it about hiring people, working at investor relations? Is it about creating a culture from the top and bringing it down to the organizations? Because how do you get this out in practice, which you obviously has, have managed to do, right? Well, I think obviously, if you look at corporate culture, leadership ha has a huge impact. And, and I would argue builds culture in a way. And in my book, leadership is is what it's about setting the agenda prioritizing work managing leading delegate delegating projects and 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 work so it's it's important on the one hand and on the other hand it's also important to provide a a sense of a joint vision um um and 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 i mean let's say the modern word of of purpose uh, right um and and i think that's important to to also inspire the team to follow a, a route. Um, and I think that's that's very important. And I think looking at MPCC, um, for me, at least leadership means leading by by example and, and inspire by leading with a clear vision. And at the same time, on the cultural side, uh, I see culture as, as a, let's say, pattern of, let's say, joint beliefs or shared beliefs in the way we get things done, all right? And, and this, is, this is how you, how you, in my view, build leadership and, and culture uh, jointly. And if you look at MPCC, you always need to look at the main sponsor behind it uh, because there is a set of, uh, let's say, um, DNA of, of culture already around. And at MPCC, we were able to combine, let's say, the startup uh, mentality in a way. You know, uh, I was the the first employee and now we're 25 working with a lot of partners um, as service providers so we we have somewhat of a startup um, mentality but the fundament of it is the dna of, of mpc and that is the uh, what i would say you know the mix of family office the family behind mpc and capital market orientation uh, because mpc capital as the main sponsor is listed itself in frankfurt so um i think that that is that is extremely important in building culture. And, and, and then, you know, if you follow that vision, people, you know, buy into that. And, uh, and, and that is important. And lastly, to your point and how to be disciplined, uh, I think that was, that was kind of also the essence of, of, of your question. How can you ensure that you stay disciplined and rational? It's also about the, not, not just the management team and the, and the people, it's also about the board. Um, and I think we have a very, very solid board that shares those views and, and has the same view on how to build a company and, and how to behave. Um, uh, and that again, for example, we have uh, Dr. Axel Schroeder, he's a representative of the family behind the MPC group, he's member in the board. Um, um, and, and, and he obviously has also, you know, designed the culture of the MPC group. And I think that is something we, we also find at MPC containerships these days. Very, very interesting. Just some quick, quick fires questions, Constantine, be before we wrap up. So you don't have to be so long in your answers, but it's interesting just from a Norwegian perspective. Can you give an insight into the best and worst part about being listed in Norway? Yeah, it's, um, I think the, uh, actually be the Norwegian path has been one of the key ingredients to our success. Um, and, and I don't say that because I'm talking to a, a Norwegian uh, or to, to, to a Norwegian format in a way or address the Norwegian community. It's because uh, being listed in Frankfurt as MPC Capital, and I used to be CFO at MPC Capital, working in a less flexible and pragmatic uh, stock market environment um, and and it's not all bad right but it's 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 less dynamic less flexible it's it's so important to to understand that you know the norwegian market is is so efficient it's 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 the also stock exchange it's the time to market time to money you know we and we basically four weeks from putting the idea on paper to raising 100 million um, and it's it's the Oslo Stock Exchange, uh, it's the investment banks, Fernley is to name a very prominent one who has been very supportive for DNB markets uh, in in our company build up. It's the the law firms, you know, it's it's the whole community around capital markets in combination with the educated and I would say entrepreneurial spirit of investors, uh, right? Because Norwegian investors or people who invest into Norwegian companies or, or listed companies, um, they understand the, the dynamics and, and have a good understanding of the asset heavy cyclical industries. Um, and we brought something to the table that was unique and that was container shipping. And that, that made 
that made you know the combination of that market being ready for something like MPC container ships and us needing a market like this um, a, a perfect match uh, in my view. And to this date, we are the only listed container company in Oslo. Um, so all our peers are listed in the US. Yet I wouldn't say we trade any any worse. Um, to the contrary, I think we we have a very solid footing in the Norwegian market. Um, and I'm happy that we are uh, listed in, in Oslo. And uh, so it, it became a bit more of a longer answer, admittedly now. But, but I, I think this is, this is really something that is, that is worth highlighting. Time to money, time to market, and the whole community around it has been extremely uh, uh, favorable and beneficial for us. Do you want to try to take the worst part of being in Oslo? Or don't see well, it's uh, Well, I'm... I'm, I'm uh, oh, oh. I mean, it's it's the flight connections from Hamburg to uh, to Oslo. I I must say, uh, I, I used to be there, you know, every every other week. Um, and now with the pandemic, obviously, you know, that has become a, a bit of a challenge. Um, and yet, uh, I, I was I, I have been uh, to Oslo a few occasions last year when you know it was possible to travel again. Yet the flight connections are a nightmare. Uh, so so that's that's one thing. And then, obviously, especially if you are in winter, the days are short and dark uh, so so that's something that uh, that is more uh, easy to digest here in uh, further south uh, on this globe but no but i think that uh, uh, that is that is probably the two things i uh, i can highlight and it seems also very manageable uh, just final theme i'm trying to put you up for a smash here if you use the tennis as an analogy so how do we solve and map out global pollution and maritime hazards? And maybe you can introduce also the passion you have for that problem. Yes, it's a it's it's a very very good point, and it's it is a huge problem, right? People currently everyone is focusing on energy transition, decarbonization, etc. I think there there are also I mean it's an important scheme, but but I'm unable to tackle it on my own. So it, it needs to be well organized and structured, as we said earlier. On the maritime pollution, um, um, for me, this is a very important topic, um, and it's a topic that lacks transparency. And, and that's also I'm I'm engaged as an ambassador at, at ICs, which is a, an, an organization which has developed a, an app. It's a nonprofit organization that has developed an app um, that uh, kind of tracks maritime pollution. Um, you can just take a photo; it gets geotagged. Um, and it's visible and you can basically, you know, bring transparency on the coastline, but also on, on deep sea uh, waters. Um, and you can actually organize cleanups. And, and what we try to achieve is the industry to help the industry in a way, right? Uh, because you need people who are engaged. You need the crew to take pictures. Um, you need to organize cleanups later on. So this is we're still at a, I would say, early stage, yet the app is functioning. Uh, and I think it's it's so important to bring transparency into this um, because that is a starting point to address it. Um, and it's probably easier to be addressed than uh, than the decarbonization of uh, of this globe um, because it just needs efforts. People can just, you know, once you're hands-on, you can do it. Um, and, and this is why I personally, I'm personally engaged uh, quite a bit with that organization, which, which was, you know, founded by by Graham Somerville Arnold. He, he he's a he's a fantastic guy, um, and he pushes this forward. and And I'm very excited about it. Uh, but there's still work to be done there as well, obviously. I wish I knew more about the results from you know the ocean cleanups, etc., which are highly you know relevant or or visible in the news media. But what are you seeing as the biggest hurdles? Because identifying shouldn't be the I know it's a hurdle, right? But it shouldn't be the hardest problem to solve. It should probably be the technology that makes this efficient process. I'm just guessing, of course, but yeah, but it, but it's it's really I mean people need to engage, and you need to I mean people need to use this app. I mean, as an example, I mean, maybe there, there are other apps as well, but the ICs, app, if, if people use it as they use uh, Instagram or TikTok, you know, if it has to be part of your day-to-day -day life. And, and, and once that, that is adopted and, and people accept it, and, you know, it's maybe not as joyful to take a picture of a, a fisher net or of plastic waste uh, on the beach than, you know, doing your, your TikTok dance, but it's, 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 it's very important. And I think we need to make it part of the, you know, the way people use 
their mobile. Um, and, and then I think with the transparency, I think to, to organize the cleanups then is, is not the biggest challenge. Um, I think to have this transparency, to have more data points, to have a fairly good view on, on, on this world. And there are obviously countries where it's probably a bit more cumbersome, where you don't get the support, where people don't want to have pictures of their port being you know, completely full of waste. It's also a lot of political tension that needs to be addressed. So um, that is also something to overcome. Um, so if everyone was for transparency, if everyone was engaged, it would be easy. Um, but this is the, the biggest hurdle in my book. It's, it's a very good point because maybe it, it was, it's a better way of saying this. This is actually like a cultural thing as well. People need to care, right? Because people, if people don't have strong incentives, usually they, they don't bother, right? Yes, absolutely. That's, that's actually better phrase than what I said, uh, but exactly um, that, that hits the nail on the, on the head. Well, I think that's a perfect ending, Konstantin. It was a pleasure finally having you on the show and I hope we can do this again in the future one day. Christopher, many thanks uh, that, that you uh, took the time to discuss with me container shipping, uh, uh, pollution and, and everything. And obviously, uh, tennis to some extent. Um, uh, looking forward to catch up again and thanks for having me. If you liked this episode, please make sure to subscribe to our channel and become a part of our community.